Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event for West Cork Literary Festival. We are here tonight with Dutch writer Connie Pullman and Irish writer Nuala O'Connor for a discussion about their historical fiction novels. Um, Nuala's novel, Nora, tells the story of Nora Barnacle, whilst Connie's novel, Your Story, My Story, is the story of Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. Nuala and Connie will be in conversation with Martina Devlin this evening. This is the first in a series of four new Dutch writing events supported by the Netherlands Letter and Fonds or the Dutch Foundation for Literature. These events take place online at 7 p.m. every Monday during July as part of this year's West Cork Literary Festival. Over the next three Mondays, we will have Meek Zlamborn and her translator, Michelle Hutchison, discussing Meek's The Seaweed Collector's Handbook, novelists Yab Robin and Lisa Spitt reading from their novels Summer Brother and The Melting and finally climate journalist Yelmer Mommers and his book How Are We Going to Explain This? All four of these new Dutch writing events are free and we would love to see you there. We have a full schedule of events throughout the month of July and these are now on our website westcorkmusic.ie forward slash LF program. Our vir virtual events will be a mix of live Zoom events and events pre-recorded in Bantry we also have a number of outdoor events with intimate audiences taking place in Bantry from Saturday the 10th to Monday the 12th of July. So we hope to see you at some of these um, events and we look forward to gathering in Bantry again soon. All of our events are made possible by the support of our funders, the Arts Council of Ireland, Cork County Council and their Library and Arts Services, Vulture Ireland and the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union. Um, I would encourage you all to, to continue to support uh, writers and bookshops um, by buying your uh, books from, from uh, real life bookshops. Our own festival bookshop is Bantry Bookshop here in the town of Bantry. Um, so I would encourage you to support those or your own local bookshop wherever it is that you live. I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Martina Devlin. Martina is an author, journalist and podcaster. She has written 10 books and has been shortlisted three times for the Irish Book Awards. She runs a podcast called City of Books in partnership with Dublin UNESCO City of Literature and Molly, the Museum of Literature Ireland. Martina's next novel is about Edith Somerville and it will be published by the Lilliput Press in early 2022. Um, I'll hand you over to Martina now and Martina will introduce you to Connie and Nora. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll, I'm going to be talking to two very talented writers about their work and um, both novels we'll be discussing are absolutely ca captivating. So let's start with you, Connie. Tell us a bit about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes and why they matter as literary figures. Well, first of all, they probably were the most famous literary couple in, in, in literature, in world literature. Sylvia Plath was uh, young when she came to England. Uh, she already wrote some poems and she came to Cambridge to study on a scholarship. And there she met Tech Youth, a wonderful, very attractive poet, uh, but who hadn't published yet. They, so, and they, they really had an amour fou as they call it in French, they, they, well, they came together and they never left each other. Four months after they met, they were married and they started a, a seven year marriage, which was very beneficial for both of them. Sylvia Plath wrote her poems, Ted got published, got, got his first prizes for his books. And so, and they had, they, they, well, they really loved each other, but then Ted also fell in love up to seven years, which happens very often with another woman. And um, Sylvia, who had a history of, of trouble, of mental troubles, committed suicide after he fell in love with another woman. Well, that's in short, um, it's very hard to describe how the, well, at least in my novel, I try to describe from the perspective of Ted Hughes how great this love was in, during those seven years, how much they loved each other, how much they meant to each other, how much they supported each other as writers, as poets, and how intelligent they both were. It's very nice to, to read about or, or to 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 meet in a novel or in biographies two people who are so intelligent and who are so committed to this 
wonderful art of poetry and literature and the novel. Mm. And Nula, we know Joyce has canonical status in literature, but why is Nora Barnacle important too? So these two met in June 1904, uh, a chance meeting on a street in Dublin and stay together until Joyce's death 37 years later. Um, like Plath and Hughes, it was a love story, a very sensual meeting of bodies, if not of minds in this case. Joyce was educated to university level. Nora, like many Irish women and many Irish people, left school at the age of 12 and went to work. Um, education only became free in the 60s in Ireland and so people generally you know, the general population weren't educated. So she was the perfect foil to Joyce's nervy intellectual disposition in that she was this very pragmatic, very earthy, very naturally good humored woman. And in fact, she became his muse and his rock and was an enormous support to him. We know that great art can't be made in isolation, particularly like with Plath and Hughes and with Nora and Jim, they have children, both had two children. So, you know, the art can't be made if you're minding the kids. So Nora very much acted as the housewife and the person who minded the, you know, bodily and emotional needs of Joyce and the family. And he was the breadwinner and the writer. Mm. They had a very happy marriage, and we'll talk a bit about that. Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes' marriage was much more tempestuous, wasn't it, Connie? Yes, well, I think they had, they had very happy moments, but of course, if a marriage ends in the suicide of one of them, you look back and, and try to find where, where, where the trouble is. But um, I think Sylvia Plath was, was already a very troubled person. Uh, she she uh, lost her father when she was nine years old, so at a very young age, and in fact yearned her whole life to meet her father again. And her longing for death was kind of a, a, a magic longing to, to reunite with her father. And she had a... a a mother took good care, a very intellectual mother, but who was kind of a slave to, to a very authoritarian father. And she grew up with this, well, how do you say in English, with it, a smothering mother. And um, I think it was very good for her to escape to England and meet this wonderful Ted Hughes. And, uh, but of course, it didn't make her healthy, the love. Yeah. It didn't um, solve her mental problems. It didn't solve her preoccupation with returning to her father, which in her case meant returning to or, 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 or reunite in death. Um, she was also a very jealous person and a very needy person. And I think Ted Hughes was a, a caring and tender man but also a man who was uh, fascinated by the aggression and the roughness of nature. So um, I think they very well fitted together and that they both, what good loves do, uh, that they were uh, uh, not a match like in, in, in Joyce and Nora, where one is taking care of the other. Here in this love, they both had to take care of each other, rather troubled and black souls. So if those black souls meet, you got another marriage. And for with Nora, who was a beautiful, I mean, I remember the monologue of Ulysses, I always repeated in my head, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, you can't hardly compare I mean, Joyce enjoyed the language of Nora, but these two, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath, feeded each other with, with poetry. And, and of course, that's also a sense of, of, of rivalry and, and of, mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. there was trouble. There was yeah. very, I think they very took very good care of each other, but of course also there were dark souls. 
Mm. What drew you, Lula, to Nora as a character? Because you tell the book very much through from her perspective. Yeah, I wanted it to be Nora's voice. I didn't want her to be the smudge on Joyce's page that she has been to a large extent. I know a lot of people have acknowledged her um, contribution to Joyce in terms of being a muse and inspiring char characters like Molly Bloom and Bertha in Exiles and Greta in The Dead. Uh, so I wanted her to step in the limelight a bit and show that she was so important and that so-called ordinary people can be magnificent. She was like living in the Edwardian era, but she was a maverick for her time. She left Joyce four months, left Ireland four months after meeting Joyce and ran away to Europe with him, which was a, an eastward migration. Most emigrants from Ireland went in the other direction uh, to America at that point. Um, she learned languages, she moved house constantly. So she... And she was very daring in that she didn't wait for a wedding ring. Bear in mind, this was the early 1900s. Yeah, I'd say she would have preferred to have the wedding ring, but he wasn't giving it. He didn't believe in marriage. He felt that the Catholic Church and women's position uh, in society because of the Catholic Church was what killed his mother. You know, the business of having child after child after child when somebody wasn't physically able for it. Um, and so he didn't want that for his life or for his partner's life. And so they went away unmarried. So that was a very daring thing to do. She couldn't really come back and expect to be welcomed by her family or by society in general if she had to come back. So she took a grand leap of faith when she went away with Joyce. Um, she, she went against what would have been expected of her, which would have been marriage to a local man in Galway, a large family similar to her, her mother had eight children similar to that, and a very settled life. So she had this unsettled flit around Europe, wearing beautiful clothes, mixing with literary society and being with this man who was a nervy intellectual essentially but who had great love for her they shared a great love of music and of humor uh, and obviously he he loved the way she spoke he found great nobility in her and Joyce was quite an egal egalitarian individual in that didn't discriminate against people of different classes to himself. His family were the fallen genteel, essentially. Um, he liked working class people and he liked their company and he treated people equally. And that's something really that I admire hugely about him because, you know, he was such a genius and a brilliant writer. You might think he was very lofty, but he actually wasn't. Mm, but your point is that Nora had a huge influence in this amazing literature, which flowed from his pen. Absolutely. He mined her stories. He mined her former loves, her phrasing, her run on way of speaking, her unfiltered way of speaking. Um, a stream of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Her word of her, her stream of consciousness, hopping from subject to subject, which actually is a very Irish way of speaking and conversing. You know, when you listen to Molly Bloom's soliloquy, it sounds like any Irish woman you know who's on a roll, you know, in a sense, like obviously the subject matter is uh, <laughs> is quite um, out there in some senses, you know, sensually or whatever, erotically. But uh, yeah, it's a wonderful piece of writing. And Nora definitely, you can hear Nora in it. Mm. And Connie, your story were, is mediated through Ted Hughes' voice. What yeah. made you decide to... Uh, explain Sylvia to us or introduce Sylvia to us through the voice of Hughes rather than give her her own? Well, it was a unique chance. I, I, I understood Ted Hughes maybe better than I understood Sylvia. Well, uh, I was very, I got very, uh, well, troubled by the way Ted Hughes was portrayed in all those biographies. Uh, as a as a villain, as the practically the murderer of his genius wife, and uh, I, I I also studied philosophy, and I did my PhD day on on gossip, on how how influential gossip is on the lives of people. So biography, in fact, is the written form of uh, the legalized form of gossip. <laughs> 
and in fact, Ted Hughes suffered all his life after the suicide of Sylvia Plath, suffered all his life as a, a, to be a character in the biographies on his, 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 his wife. And there were a lot of them. And then in all those biographies, he passive had to, passively had to read about himself as a, as a, a rather uh, evil character. He chose not to cooperate though, didn't he? No, that's because that's that's the best thing you can do if you're famous and other people write about you or talk about you or in, in, in documentaries, you better shut up. <laughs> no one will believe you. And that's that's the sense you get when you're very famous or famous by in a passive way, you don't react. You are a king. You, you are above this kind of gossip, above the matter. Because you know it won't work. You it won't. If if someone wants to make you a scapegoat, and in fact, German Greer openly admitted that they chose. Uh, they were, I mean we were talking about the seventies after the the suicide of Sylvia Plath in 63, 1963. Uh, in the seventies, there was the beginning of the second uh, gulf of, of feminism wave. Mm -hmm. That's the best word. And this was a much more aggressive fan feminism than the first uh, feminists. Um, and Germaine Aguirre was the queen of the second uh, feminist movement. In fact, admitted that they chose Sylvia Plath because of her rather aggressive poems as, a, as the queen of their, of their movement. And they also needed a scapegoat. If you choose a, a king, you need also need a bad guy. If you choose a good guy, you need a bad guy. So she admitted that, that, that they chose Ted Hughes as, the scape, as a scapegoat. So the Hughes voice actually complains a lot about being represented as a monster by what he calls militant yeah. feminists. Is yeah. that your view as well? Well, no, I think I won't, I'm, I will, I don't make him complain. I don't think that it was like Ted Hughes didn't really get it, what it was to be so famous, that he didn't know that, that he abhorred the passiveness of being famous, of being known in a public domain, as you say it in a rather chic way. Um, he, well, in fact, he, he, he had this, this what, 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 what Marlene Dietrich had at the end of her life, leave me alone. But you can't be left alone if you're that famous. People will get you. It's, it's, it's a very harsh law of, of fame. People will want to know what you're doing and where you are. So if, even if he, he went out fishing in Canada, they, everyone knew he was fishing in Canada. Mm -hmm. So there was something rather naive how Ted Hughes handled his fame. Um, so he wanted to be read, but he didn't want the trappings that came with it. Yeah. That's the perfect way to put it, yes. And was it the same for Joyce? Yeah, the, when Joyce became properly famous after Ulysses was published, uh, he began to withdraw. He would not give interviews. He did have an official biography and he worked closely with the biographer, but he held back a lot. He wouldn't give public interviews. He disdained people coming up to him and Nora in restaurants when they were trying to eat. He mm. just became very, very quiet and wouldn't speak to people. Um, there's a, an American writer observed Joyce and the family on holidays in Belgium one time and kind of was on the same trip to Waterloo as them to see the battle site and was describing Joyce in detail to a letter back to his lover in America, this man. And he was saying things like, oh, they just looked like an ordinary family on holidays. Well, that's because they were just an ordinary family on holidays. And he described in detail how he disliked Nora's looks. He liked Lucia's looks that the four of the Joyce family sat apart from each other on the bus back to uh, Brussels um, and was trying to make out that this was somehow strange was reading a lot into the situation of 
a man who was just trying to conduct his life. And that is the horrible thing about fame, that thing about being watched all the time. And Joyce didn't like it at all. You how know? did Nora feel about it? I don't know how Nora, well, she didn't, I mean, enjoy about, the attention. Not really, no. She, because it meant sometimes as well that he drank more. So, but the other thing was there is, she's on record as saying, oh, look at him now. He's like a monkey in a cage with his fame. We should throw nuts at him. So she was always quite irreverent about things like that. So it didn't, fame didn't impress her. What was handy about fame was that he got the sponsorship of Harriet Weaver and Sylvia Beat themselves to become accustomed to because they both loved style. They were big spenders. They weren't very skilled at being wealthy people. They were actually more skilled when they had no money um, at survival. But uh, when they got money, they lashed it around and weren't very careful with it at all, which may have proved, you know, to be unhelpful, especially to the children in terms of education and careers and things like that. But definitely Joyce, didn't like the trappings of fame, but liked the money. Well, let's hear from the novels. Connie, would you start? Would you read us a passage from of course, of course. your story, my story? I will. Just start at the beginning, hoping that it's good from page on. Page I on. like that sound, pages turning. I bet you like it too, Nula. <laughs> to most people, we exist only in books, my bride and I. For the past 35 years, I've had to watch with impotent horror as our real lives were buried beneath a mudslide of apocryphal stories, false witness, gossip, fabrication, and myth. Our true complex personalities were replaced by hackneyed characters reduced to mere images, tailor-made to soothe a readership with an appetite for sensationalism. And in all of this, she was the brittle saint and I the brutal traitor. I have remained silent until now. She had something in her of the religious fanatic, that reckless longing for a higher form of purity, the saintly and violent willingness to sacrifice herself, her old false self to murder it so that she could be born again, clean, free, and above all, real. In the seven years we were together, I never saw her with anyone, not even our children, as she really was the way I knew her, the woman I lived with, the woman who, stamping like a filly in heat, bit my cheek and draw blood the first time we met. We didn't embrace, we attacked each other. Snorting with pleasure, with joy, I yanked the red hairband from her head, tore the silver earrings from her lobes, I would have liked to rip her dress to shreds, to strip her of all the trappings of decency, obedience, and civility of falseness. It was cruel, it hurt, it was real. We plundered each other. Less than four months later, I married her. I should have known that for a woman who bites instead of kisses, loving was the same as lashing out. I should have realized that by stealing her jewelry, I was only tearing away her ornamentation and taking it as my trophy. Whoever begins this kind of love knows that violence and destruction are hidden in its heart to the death. One of us was done for from the very start. It was either her or me. In that all-consuming violence called love, I met my match. Mm, we plundered each other. There's an image. Nula, do you have a passage you might read us from Nora? Yeah. 
It's interesting that um, Ted and Sylvia married on Bloomsday the 16th of June, which yes, is yes. commemoration of Joyce's uh, first meeting, first actual date with Nora. So I'm going to read just a tiny few paragraphs from a chapter. Actually, it's the whole chapter. I do very short chapters. It's called Ireland. And this is one month after they've met. Nora has fallen in love with Jim. He won't say he loves her yet because he's reticent, he's holding back. She gets it out of him eventually. To Jim, I am Ireland. I'm island shaped, he says. Large as the land itself, small as the Muglins, a woman on her back, splayed and hungry, waiting for her lover. I'm limestone and grass, heather and granite. I am rising paps and cleft of valley. I'm the raindrops that soak and the sea that rims the coast. Jim says I am sharp and shamrock, harp and shamrock, tribe and queen. I am high cross and crowned heart held between two hands. I'm turf, he says, and bog cotton. I am the sun pulling the moon on a rope to smile over the Mam Turk mountains. Jim styles me his sleepy eyed Nora his squirrel girl from the pages of Ibsen. I am pirate queen and cattle raider. I'm his blessed little blackguard. I am, he says, his Auburn marauder. I'm his honorable barnacle goose. Nora, Jim says, you are syllable, word, sentence, phrase, paragraph and page. Your fat vowels and shushing sibilants. Nora, Jim says, you are story. That's it. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, the, the idea of how she represented it, Ireland to him, you know, turf and bog cotton, the actual physicality of the land. Mm. What challenges did you both face in finding these characters voices, bearing in mind they were real people? This is biofiction. Mm -hmm. Connie. Um, what do you really want to know? Sorry, I, I was um, still dreaming. The real about people. Ireland. It's challenging to write about real oh, people. Yes, it is. Well, it's also kind of dangerous, and um, it's the danger that attracted me to to try and do it in the proper way. I mean, um, in fact, I did something that Ted Hughes hated most to be talked about. To to I, I kind of robbed his life. I, I, I felt I had to excuse myself constantly. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that no one could have defended him better and with more love than a woman and, uh, and a woman writer. So that's what I also did. I, I found it, 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 um, it, 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 it a kind of transgression, but a transgression that is permitted by literature. Uh, by uh, the the act of, the loving act of imagination and at the same time I thought of it as a as a deed of love for his character for his poetry for what uh, for the the way that the passivity he had to endure during his life for the love of uh, for the way he had loved Sylvia Plath so it was it was both at the same time transgression and a loving, a loving act of love. Like homage. And it, it's certainly an homage, yes. But what about for Sylvia Plath? Did you not feel anything for her? Yes, I also felt very much for her. And, I, and, I, and in fact, it is, it's through the eyes of that use, I started to see her more real. I started to see her, um, feel much more compassion for, for her, loved her much more than I loved her before. I also understood her poetry better after I started to look at her uh, as Ted Hughes. Uh, I got very much closer to Sylvia Plath than before I started writing this book. So, and I reread uh, her poetry and I reread uh, her- The bell jar. jar yes. Mm. And I understood it better and I, I loved it more. Mm. Um, but I needed the eyes of Ted Hughes to become so loving. 
And Nula, did you find any particular challenges in finding Nora's voice? Not so much finding the voice. I suppose, like Connie, it feels audacious to take on an icon like Joyce. Um, so you felt the fear and did it anyway? I did indeed. And I mean, I think that fear lasts about 10 minutes and then you get into the research and you reread the work and you read the biographies and you start to ask questions. So you have been presented with this stuff, filters in place. Some people view biofiction as a form of cannibalism. Um, I love what you said, Connie, about the gossip thing. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Um, you know, Peter Costello said that biography is a higher form of fiction. So maybe biofiction is a higher, higher form. You know, it's you're taking the facts of someone's life and you're trying to come at them with empathy. You're trying to embody people. You're trying to be sympathetic. And similar to you, Connie, by the end of the project, I loved Joyce and Nora much more and I understood them more. So I'm an empath anyway, but my empathy grew and grew. And now I'm as defensive as any academic about Joyce, you know? So it's like you befriend these people and you try to present them. Well, for me, that's what it's like. I try to present them with love and sympathy to the reader. And I guess my hope is that the reader will fall in love with the, these types of characters that I uh, embody, the likes of Emily Dickinson, who I've written about before, and Nora Barnacle. And I've had letters from people who've read the book saying they're delighted now, they feel they understand her more. Um, and I just think job done then, you know, if people have a better understanding of the whole, um, the whole encompassing thing of Joyce and his work and his love and how important and entwined everything was, then I feel like I've done the job I set out to do. And it's about giving her her a proper place in his life as opposed to her being somehow reduced to an adjunct. Exactly. Yeah. So can I ask you both what information you based your fiction on? Was it letters, diaries, eyewitness accounts of incidents? How did you compile the bricks and mortar? Well, what Nola mentioned, everything. I think there isn't a sentence about both of them that I haven't read. There's not a poem I haven't read. There's not an interpretation of the poems I haven't read. I've read everything. And the, the big difference, of course, of, of, to, 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 put, to say biography is, 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 is fiction is not completely true. You also have to think about what you promise a reader. If you write a novel, which we did, is, is a total different promise than when you write a biography. A biographer promises the truth, which is, of course, rather absurd because he gets everything secondhand, talks to people, interviews, people lie. The moment someone dies, they start lying about their own position in their lives. They make themselves bigger and more beautiful and more loved. So it's a very tricky, it's, it's a very dangerous genre, but it, I, lo I love the genre, but it's a dangerous genre. But what we do is, is, is exactly, you try to, to make the reader love the person you studied uh, like you do. You make the, I mean, people are complex. People are complex. And it's what literature can do is to, to that you love complex people that you forgive their flaws, that you don't want them to be perfect, but you also don't, don't be, can't be so judgmental as some biographer, bi biographies are. But the research to, to when you write about a historic uh, person, the research is wonderful. You can read everything and, and you have so, and then you have to forget everything and create your own historical person with a mixture of imagination and truth. Mm. Was it like that for you, Nula? Read everything and then set it to one side? Yeah, absolutely. I kind of drip fed the research to myself as I wrote. I knew the arc of their story, but I fed more of it to myself as I wrote, just for freshness, you know, so that the story is unfolding for me as much as the reader. I think Connie's exactly right. You come at the work with all of the information you can gather, but then the, 
there's a particular and personal slant that you bring to it. So, you know, for me, I'm a feminist. It was important that Nora got to say her piece. It was important that I addressed uh, the criticism of Nora about her care of Lucia, which I didn't hold with or agree with. Well, talk to talk to us about that. Not everybody might be familiar with it. Lucia had um, a mental illness. Yeah, their daughter Lucia was diagnosed as a schizophrenic. Um, she went to more than 20 different doctors over the course of her, her treatment and she stayed in various asylums. She had a range of um, symptoms and issues, I suppose. So she could be catatonic. She had a tendency to disappear for days on end. She was a little bit um, promiscuous. So she was endangering herself as a young woman. Um, she had a penchant for naked sea swimming and living on champagne, fruit and cigarettes. And so she was sort of out of control. And that would have been, I suppose, regarded as bohemian at one stage. It was all the other elements. Is that well, that's you... it. I mean, she was mixing with the lost generation in Paris and taking her cue from the Americans mm. who were much more modern in their thinking than Joyce and Nora were, who at this stage were in their 40s. They were this quite bourgeois, you know, family orientated people um but nor are lucia was mixing with the guggenheims and beckett's and hemingways and what have you so she was with a younger set um but she wasn't prepared well for a career or she wasn't educated well her education was disrupted constantly because and they then, around yeah moving around and then she had you know whatever we don't really know 100 percent what was wrong with her who knows if the schizophrenia diagnosis was correct or not but she ended up being incarcerated from you know her 20s to basically when she died in her 70s um and the narrative was against Nora Nora was done down by a lot of people saying that she didn't care about Lucia but from all of my reading of personal testimonies of friends of theirs of the biographies of letters Nora loved her daughter and cared deeply about her she did not shunt her into an asylum in fact Giorgio was the first person her brother who committed Lucia to an asylum. So he got the train in motion. So I wanted to resurrect Nora as the loving mother I believe she was. And that there is evidence that she was. It's not just my, you know, personal slant on this. It's it's true. Um, so yes, you do come at the fiction, the biofiction, and at your subjects with a particular uh, idea in your head and that can change as you research and as you read widely around your subject. Like I probably was feeling more unfair to Joyce when I started the project than where I ended up. I now empathize and sympathize with him in so much, a much deeper way now. You know, my love for him has only grown. Mm. And Connie, in fact, your novel also deals with a mental breakdown to some extent in oh. Nora Nula's book. It's in relation to Lucia Joyce, but in yours, in relation to Sylvia Plath, how do you deal sensitively with the question of mental health? Well, in the case of Sylvia Plath, it's much more difficult to, I mean, she's, she's in fact, she's, it was humanly more diagnosed than during her life. Um, it, it's, she didn't have, uh, well, she didn't have the official naming of like, she's or bipolar or whatever it's it's um what was much more in well what i had to deal more with what happens to a per person who is uh, left after someone else has, has committed suicide um so when um, a kind of mel mental weakness or a mental predisposition leads to suicide uh it it, it, it is so of influence of someone's life. And that was what I had to, because I'm in the character of that youth, is what I was uh, much more um, focused on. That's why I, I make, I, I sit, make uh, all this, the quote from Arthur Miller uh, from his uh, play After the Fall, when he says to his character Maggie, which is in fact Marilyn Monroe, and he says, uh, a suicide kills two people, Maggie. Mm -hmm. And then there's this awful sentence. That's what it's meant for. That's how, you, how people who commit suicide are also made uh, 
made, made into murderers. They do something that is of so much influence of the life of, of the people who are left. I mean, Sylvia Plath's son, Nicholas, also committed suicide. So that it's a chain of, of, of sadness and of incapability to, to deal with life. Mm. But Sylvia Plath, it's, it's much harder. If, if, she had a, uh, if she had had a, a clear diagnosis, it would be, uh, I think she was much less interesting than she's now, which is, it's not very clear what was wrong with her. Or she's suffering so much from the death of her father. She already tried to commit suicide when she was 10 and when she was 20 and now on her 30th. Before she met Ted Hughes. Yes, before she met. And it's uh, in what she wrote because she was so clear thinker. She was a good, great thinker. And in her diaries, it's almost always the longing to be with her father. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is a kind of magical thinking where, where Joan Didion wrote about so beautifully, which starts after someone disappears, after, some, after you feel so lost in life that you only have magical thinking to, to get through it. Believe in Santa Claus. Believe that he comes back. Uh, keep his shoes. So of course you think he can use them when he comes back. So magical thinking and is what we do. And I think for Sylvia Plath, it was thinking about death, was thinking about like it lasted a short while. Hmm. Not realistic. Did both of you walk in the footsteps of your subjects? Did you visit the houses they lived in or the apartments, the places they holidayed in? Nula? Yes, I definitely did. I um I was lucky enough to get a residency at the Centre Culturel in Paris for a month and I finished writing the novel there and I would write in the morning and spend my afternoons walking around their haunts. So the places they lived, they had 19 addresses at Paris, in Paris. In the Paris alone. Paris in alone. alone. <laughs> and and uh, I went to the other cities Paris. as well too, didn't they? Yeah, so I went to Trieste as well, where they lived. Um, I had never been there before. It's called the Jewel of the Adriatic. And when you go there, you can see why it's just magnificent. And sort of tucked away, you know, it's, it's not too far from Venice, but as a tourist destination, when you think about Italy, people probably, it doesn't immediately spring to people's minds, but it's beautiful and, you know, relatively unchanged since the Joyce's lived there. Beautiful wide square, the sea is there, uh, Miramar, the castle is up the coast. It's just stunning. So that was a revelation to me. Did you feel uh, closer to your characters when you were in the places they lived? Oh yeah. They're like ghosts walking ahead of you down those streets, those little, sort of Italian narrow laneways that are still cobbled. You could just see them ahead of you on the hill, you know, um, definitely. And I like to do that. I went to Zurich as well. I'd been there when I was young. I worked in Switzerland for a short spell. So I went back to Zurich to see it again because, um, you know, I needed to remember it a bit better. And I went in January, <laughs> uh, so it was very cold and that really gave me a sense of what it was like. They never stopped complaining about the cold in Zurich. So, it, and they lived in terrible places in Zurich, like really bad flats overrun with mice, earth floors. So it gave me a real sense of what it might've been like for them to be there. It was a very different atmosphere to Trieste where they had been. So yeah, I, I loved that. I love writing about place and to get the atmosphere and try and have the place flare up around the reader as if she is there too was my aim with that. And um, people have told me that during these pandemic times of non-travel, they've really enjoyed traveling around the place with the Joyce's. So yeah, I did walk the ground. I find it important when I have a first draft done is when I usually start that work. So that when I go to do my first big edit, I have the places in my head. I know what the ground underfoot is like. You know, a lot of Europe hasn't changed a lot you know, so it's it's easy to have that feeling of being there when they were there. You know how it smelled, how it sounded. Mm. One thing that surprised me, Connie, about um, 
your Plath Hughes novel was their interest in Yeats. Um, yes. They, the, Sylvia lived in an apartment in London where Yeats lived, but also that both of them went to Sligo and visited to her Bally Lee, oh, yes. presumably Gort. But um, I don't know enough about English literature to understand why you're so surprised. Isn't he very good? No, I just didn't realize that oh. both Plath and Hughes had um, a, a, a passion for him. Of course, he's very good. I mean, he's the Nobel Prize winner. Yes, I know. Uh, so, well, I was not surprised. I mean, I think he was for both po poets a, a great a example of a great poetry, of a great poet. And, um, but that they visited, that they did what we're talking about, which is yeah. following. Which the I don't, I don't do. I what Nola did. I didn't do. I just, I, I just went into the head of places, and I didn't mind to go to visit. I should have. In fact, I should have done it. I could have given myself a great tour in in England and go to London and then go to God to America. I didn't do that. I. I, 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 more, I often wrote about the people who really exist and I never visit the real places. I don't know why, I'm so much more, I'm not that, I, I, I can't see places in fact. When I, when I travel myself, I don't see anything. Uh, I only, I'm, I'm only concerned with what someone else is thinking or I'm, I'm not that visual, I, I don't have that visual, talent I, i'm only thinking about thinking well <laughs> that came in handy when i when i had to go in into the character of tech use but so sometimes i did well i have to look you, you can google you know you can google yeah. the google maps I, so i visited this fitzroy road and in london and Where I, the apartment was yeah and i visited the square thing oh it looks great and nice but if I, I did, I, you, you can also read it in my book. I don't use many very uh, surrounding uh, information mm -hmm. about surroundings. I'm into a head of a man who's trying to get into the head of his wife who committed suicide, trying to understand, trying to understand their love, trying to understand how they, they influence each other, trying to understand her poetry, trying to understand life. In fact, so. You don't then you don't use which mm. then you don't have much use of how the apartment looked. Did you stay Nula 100 percent with the facts or did you invent anything to give narrative tension to your story? Yeah I mean this is the the bargain I make with the reader is that this is a novel. I am sort of what I would call a faithful biofiction writer in that I stick to the facts as they're known in the chronology but then I also festoon a little because you have to it's about embodying somebody it's about creating believable scenes what Virginia Woolf called moments of being so I want to create these moments of being for the reader so she feels like she's in the room with Nora she's I want to find out how did Nora feel about her life with Jim how did she feel about his writing? How did she feel about his drinking? What was it like to be a mother to those children? And so I have to create scenes where she's doing that work of looking at her life and thinking about it. And we don't have that testimony from Nora. And so I have to invent it. But some I letters, use- perhaps? <clears throat> Pardon? Are there some letters perhaps? There are some letters, yeah. She's quite a- um, she has that Molly Bloomish run on style in the letters. She's also quite humorous and self deprecating, you know, and so I, I took some of that um, to put into her voice. Um, so yeah, I, it's important for me that those scenes are there. Like I had a good few scenes where Nora is on her own with the children and there's no gym in sight. Um, and several of those were cut by the editor, which I was sort of surprised about, but the editor was more interested in, you know, making the thing tighter and more, more sort of, I suppose, trying to think about what readers want. Whereas I don't tend to think about readers. I just think about the story or myself or my own relationship with the thing. So I had scenes where Nora had absolute agency and was out and about by herself or with the children. 
but they were deemed not as necessary to the plot as such. I mean, a life is not a plot, but you know what I mean? To the arc of the story, they were deemed not as necessary. And so they were cut, you know, and I kind of miss those scenes in the book. I'd like if they were there. Outtakes, Nuala. We want outtakes. <laughs> exactly. <not> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Connie, did you stay completely with the facts or did you invent? Obviously conversations oh, are invented sometimes. I'm trying to say I, I have a bargain with the readers. It's a novel, so imagination is, is the biggest part. But when I present in the novel something as a fact, then it's a fact. So if it's, if it's very biographical and I say we went to on the boat uh, on this ship to America, then they went on the ship to America. But facts are nothing. I mean, literature and even life starts when you interpret, give an interpretation to the facts that they were on a ship to America is nothing. When you write, we felt like Scott Fitzgerald and like Zelda, then you have an interpretation. You know they want to have an adventure and you know that they have an identification with an other famous couple in literature. So literature starts when, when the facts have a, get a color and, and that's what you do in a novel. But there are no, if anything in, in the novel which um, sounds like a fact is a fact. I, d I didn't invent facts. Mm -hmm. I mean, like that, that, that Sylvia Plath that a, a friend or which she didn't have. So there are no things like that in the novel. You mentioned something there, um, Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Why are we so fascinated by literary couples, whether uh, Plath and Hughes or the Fitzgeralds or the Hemingways? What is it about these couples? Well, they tend to ruin each other, which is fascinating. <laughs> they, they're so, it's, it's also extreme. It's not that they sit at home and they get their children and they go to school and it's 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 it, it it's extreme. They travel and they give dinners and they meet great friends and they're all interesting and they gossip and they they have adventures and they 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 go to the Côte d'Azur and they 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 well they have conversations which you don't have with your neighbor. It, it's a fascinating life and they ruin each other. Because they tear each other drunk and they get drunk and they commit suicide and they they're awful and at the same time they're tender and nice and complex. They're complex. Yeah, I agree. I'm reading um, at the moment a novel about Yates and Georgie and their I, friends are Pound, Ezra Pound and Dorothy Shakespeare, you know, who are busily ruining each other in the corner. Um, and uh, Yates and Georgie are not getting on too well either. And she's summoning spirits to keep them close. So, yeah, I agree. I think it's lovely. we couldn't destroy Laura because she was practically indestructible, but he managed to destroy himself with his drinking. Uh, it affected his eyes, it affected his stomach, and he eventually died of a stomach issue. Um, so yeah, it is it is the, the fact that they are socializing with people like the Hemingways and the Guggenheims. And there's a romance to that. For us who are drawn to literary things, it's like, you know, you're kind of looking at it and thinking, what if, what, what if I had been brave enough to run away with, some mad intellectual off to you, you know, that kind of way. It's it's a little bit of vicarious living. I did. <laughs> yes. It's you true. did, did you? <laughs> well, my first, I wrote a novel about my first uh, husband was very well known and very naughty a journalist. And um, uh, and he died four years after. We were very much in love and he died. And I wrote, a, a, not a novel, but I wrote a book about him. What I called it a novel. So I had I had my own uh, uh, Ted you Sylvia Plath marriage, and uh, I know it's it, it, it is fascinating. It is you you feel so much more alive when when life is is troublesome. Yeah. But also you're younger. When you're young, you feel indestructible, but you also feel that life should have these highs and excitements. Yeah. 
I don't think I ever felt indestructible. I always felt rather weak and 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 and, and vulnerable, and then especially and then I always knew that I was the biggest enemy was in me, not not the other person. I've never been scared of of dangerous men. I always knew it's it's me. It's like like James Joyce who ruined himself even when he had such a strong Nora beside him or Sylvia Plath who had this this huge love it's never enough and did you feed this personal experience into your interpretation of the plan no. so everyone who reads your story my story says it's your story even <laughs> when it's about a, a man who lost his wife so you you personalize that uh, you, it, you, you, and that's only why you get interested in other people so much because you, you can understand them better if you identify. Sure, all fiction is autobiographical. You have to write from something and you take your own experience. Was, was it like that for you, Nula? Yeah, I mean, I think you put in your, you, well, your personal attitudes and mores and biases can't help but rise to the surface in it, you know, so whatever small wisdom you gather in the course of a life, you know, can go into this thing and you think about how you feel about things. It's not that you're shoving your own point of view into people's minds, but you might make a side comment about, there's a side comment in Connie's book about how friends don't want you to change. And I thought, oh, absolutely, exactly. You know, that is such a truism. It's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And so these lines can leap out at the reader and they can apply it to their own lives and yeah. just ruminate on it. You have a great line in Nora, uh, in the voice of, of Nora, where she says, if God Almighty came down from heaven, Jim had find him something to do, which for me summed up the character that he was great at delegating and having people take care of uh, aspects of his life. Yeah, he wanted to be a gentleman, essentially somebody who lives on somebody else's money but he didn't have the means to do it. And so by hook or by crook, he was going to have this life. He wanted to be the complete, complete creative. And that means having financial supports that don't come essentially mostly from yourself. And so he found a way to do it. And that way was Harriet Weaver. He was very lucky that in one way that he met Harriet, um, she gifted him more than a million pounds in today's money over the course of her gifting. And you know, Sylvia Beach reckoned she was kind of the ruination of the family in the sense that she didn't, she wasn't strict enough with them with the money and then... There were no conditions around the money. Yeah, she thought she was funding him time to write. She was funding a lifestyle where he drank to excess, mm. went on lengthy holidays, paid for top hotels. She didn't know, she didn't realise for a long time that that's what her money was going on, you know. Mm. So what's next for both of you? Connie, what are you working on at the moment? Well, um, during the, the last years, I, I, because this novel had so many translations, uh, your story, my story, I've been walking beside this book for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And for me, this novel was so important. It, it got so into me. It got so under my skin especially Ted you but, but, but Sylvia Plath also, and the, the matter of suicide. So I've been thinking a lot about suicide, but that's, that's beside the way. I, I can't yet, I don't, I'm, I'm still married to this book and have to break up with that and with Sylvia before I can start a new novel. So I've been writing great essays about books I read and now I'm studying the book of Olivia Lang, everybody, and I'm going to write a big essay about it in a, in our huge, in, in our biggest paper. And so I, I spoke about Philip Roth, the biography by Bailey, and mm -hmm. so I write articles about my colleagues in, mm -hmm. in crime. Well, I'm a big fan of essays. Nula, what are you working on at the moment? Um, yeah, it's very hard to write a book when you're promoting a book. I've had to take uh, a good few months off to promote Nora. Uh, I'm writing essays too. I'm writing about, um, well, the latest published essay was about crying. So I'm writing a lot about weeping. what it means weeping. crying. Yeah. Crying. Crying, yeah, weeping. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I'm writing about, I suppose, being an introverted writer in middle age and what that means. Um, I'm writing about, um, yes, things like the body crying. I wrote an essay, published an essay recently in Craft about uh, reclaiming the Virgin Mary statue as a, as a sort of a comforting icon for a secular world. That's interesting. <laughs> And I'm also, I've started another novel about another <clears throat> maverick Irish woman, the pirate, Irish pirate Anne Bonny. And so I started work on that last year. I've had to take a break from it, but I'm, I'm easing back into it now. Mm, she's there bubbling away in your mind. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I just want to end by pointing out that Connie has an excellent description of literature in your story, my story. She says that it narratively shapes what it is for humans to live. I find that fascinating. I've been carrying that around with me. So thank you both so much to Connie Palman, author of Your Story, My Story, and to Nula O'Connor, author of Nora, for um, sharing your thoughts about your subjects. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks you. a million. I'd just like to thank everybody as well on behalf of West Cork Literary Festival. That was an absolutely marvellous event. I could have stayed uh, listening to you all for another hour easily. Um, I loved both of your books and I loved hearing about them in more detail. And I would encourage everybody to go out and get a copy of uh, Connie's book, My Story, Your Story, and Nula's book, Nora. They're both absolutely fabulous read reads. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody who's who tuned in to watch this event and also um, the Dutch Foundation for Literature for supporting it and Connie Palman, Nula O'Connor and Martina Devlin for doing such a wonderful event tonight. So I, I hope you all enjoyed it and that we see you all in Bantry um, before too long. So thank you very much. Thank you.